What's going on, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast. We got a breaking news edition. Oregon will hire Georgia defensive coordinator Dan Lanning to become the program's next head football coach. If you're new here, I'm Max Torres. I'm the publisher of Ducks Digest on Sports Illustrated, covering the Oregon Ducks on Fan Nation. Um, yeah, we got a huge, huge uh, news to get in here today. Uh, I'm joined by Ducks Digest reporter Dylan Rubin King. Dylan, how we doing, man? We finally have our answer. Yeah, we thought we had it yesterday. There was that report that came out, and, and then everybody's like, nope, backtrack, the, dispute it. It's not accurate. And then today, like, well, just kidding. It was accurate. And so it's been so cool to see everybody's reactions, all the players' reactions. And clearly, this is a home run hire that everybody's everybody's all in on, and I'm all in on it, too. Yeah, I this was the one that I was, uh, you know, growing increasingly excited about um, as far as, you know, just the options that that the Ducks had here. Um, I think that this is, you know, a, a huge hire. Uh, you know, obviously we have a, a source on uh, or sorry, a story on Ducks Digest. Um, but my uh, my source texted me, um, you know, the, the university still hasn't uh, announced it officially, but my source texted me uh, deal done landing. So uh, he's gonna be um, he's gonna be the next guy, and you can see all these other players are um, are you know reacting to it um, on uh, you know on Oregon's team. So um, you know it looks like they're obviously super excited about it and uh, everything that's kind of going on right now. So yeah, we're waiting for the you know official announcement from the university, but um, I'm I'm pretty confident in my source that that this is gonna be the guy, and then um, I think that. Dylan, one of our guys, uh, shared a statement about uh, from Kirby Smart. So um, I don't know if this – I'm trying to verify it before. Um, but, yeah, what what are your kind of uh, initial, initial reactions to this, Dylan? Well, yesterday when the news came out that he was potentially the guy, I didn't even know he was – you know, open to taking other offers. I figured given the year that Georgia's had and the fact that he's still fairly new as their defensive coordinator, I believe his first year was just a couple of seasons ago. I can fact check that. But uh, I really didn't think he would be taking any offers. Um, 2019 was his first year as defensive coordinator at Georgia. So I didn't expect, given the year that they've had and the fact that, you know, a national championship is still there for them, I really didn't think that, you know, I mean, I figured they'd probably shoot him a call, but I didn't think he would he'd be willing, given the crazy, crazy successful year that they've had on defense. Um, but I'm I'm very surprised that, um, you know, he was at the top of the list because from all the names we were seeing, it was Chip Kelly, Justin Wilcox, Lane Kiffin. Um, I figured it was going to be an offensive minded coach and I'm not upset that it's not. I'm just saying, you know, I was thinking it was going to be more offensive minded, but. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very, very excited, super hyped. Um, you know, I've, I've been a fan of what I've seen from Georgia's defense. And given the talent coming back, it's going to be, it should be a really good year for Oregon's defense, like 2019 level of elite and maybe more. Yeah, there's still a, a lot that obviously has to, to be figured out and, and a lot of pieces that, uh, you know, need to be shifted around on, on this team. We don't know who's coming back or, or who's going to the, the NFL draft other than uh, Mali Sala, Amavai Laulu, and Kayvon Thibodeau. And then before we get too far into this podcast, I, I got to do the, you know, journalistic courtesy. Um, Chip Towers of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution was the first one to report this story. Um, that was on Friday, December 10th. So have to give him the original credit, um, but that got a obviously got a lot of uh, a lot of people excited about this, and it looks like we're getting some questions and comments. So uh, if you guys are tuning into the live show, thanks so much for tuning in. Go ahead and uh, you know any questions that you have about the hire, um, I'll, we'll try to answer that the best that we can. And if you're watching it on the replay, thanks for tuning in and go ahead and drop a comment. Uh, let me know your reactions to the hire and your thoughts and, and what you think uh, landing should be prioritizing. First question from Sam Kim. Max, do you have a general bio on Lanning? Don't know much about him, to be honest. Yeah, so the uh, you know kind of the lowdown with Lanning. He's uh, the current defensive coordinator for the Georgia Bulldogs, uh, the number three seed, I believe, in the college football playoffs um, right now, uh, with the only loss coming to Alabama Crimson Tide in the SEC Championship. 
Uh, he had been on the, uh, he's been on the Georgia staff for uh, a couple years now. He uh, was promoted to uh, defensive coordinator in February, 2019. And then before that, he was on Georgia's staff for one year as the outside linebackers coach. And then if you want to rewind it a little bit more, um, he was serving on the Memphis staff under uh, Mike Norvell as the inside linebackers coach. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so Landing joined the Memphis staff in 2016 after spending the 2015 season at Alabama as a graduate assistant with the outside linebackers. Uh, and then before he got to Alabama, this is off of uh, Georgia's official website. Uh, prior to Alabama, Landing held positions at Pittsburgh in 2011, Arizona State from 2012 to 2013, and Sam Houston State from 2014, or sorry, in 2014. And then kind of just giving you a little bit more background, he's a young guy, right? I think that's why some people might have been uh, a little bit hesitant to uh, to make this hire, considering that he's a, a younger guy and um, has never been a head coach before. I think that's a, a big thing that a lot of people kind of uh, were considering when they were kind of laying out the criteria and, and what kind of uh, coach they wanted. So he's 35 years old, uh, originally from North Kansas City, Missouri, and then he played uh, he played college football uh, at William Jewell, which is a D2 school. So that's kind of a little a little rundown of um you know who who dan lanning is you know we're gonna have a bunch of content on uh ducks digest just uh laying out kind of who he is and and you know some more background information um but dylan my kind of origin my initial thoughts to this i i really like it because because the ducks took a chance right i think that was one of the biggest concerns that some people had when mario left is that the coaching carousel was just absolutely insane so because of that, after the Lincoln Riley domino fell when he went to USC, all these other coaches started bolting left and right because, you know, they had to they had to fill their staffs um, and kind of figure all that stuff out. So the, the coaching pool was pretty limited. And you have names like Chip Kelly coming out, uh, you know, UCLA head coach, Justin Wilcox, the Cal head coach. Lane Kiffin was a name that was out there. And then Urban Meyer emerged. Uh, as a name that a lot of people were talking about the the current Jags head coach. So I'm really happy that they made this hire because you have all this talent on the roster, um, especially on the defensive side of the ball. I can't remember if I was talking to you or Nick just about, I think the defensive talent has been utilized a lot better, uh, at least on, on the roster this year than the offensive talent. That's not to say that they're better or worse, but I just feel like it's been utilized better. And then kind of with all that, I feel like, you want to take that swing at, at a, a big hire because there's so much upside with landing and the ducks are at a really high point right now. And if you, if you make that safe hire, I just feel like you're, you know, kind of limiting yourself. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty ha happy about this one. Yeah. I think the fact that he's a young coach that he's only 35 and he's never been a head coach. I think given the success that he's had as a defensive coordinator and as an assistant, you know, he's been in Alabama, he's been at Arizona State, he's been at Pitt, like he's been all over. And so I think given that, I think this is the time, this is a perfect time for he, him to be, you know, a head coach. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure he's going to come in at some point, but I was listening to um, the Twitter spaces last night with his brother in there and, um, you know, Dan Lanning's brother. And his brother was saying, like, this has always been his end goal to be a head coach um, at any level. And, um, you know, he said if, if the opportunity came to be a head coach, um, he would take it. He said he probably wouldn't have taken another defensive coordinator job. He said the goal was to be a head coach. And I think given, um, you know, just the, the success he's had as a defensive coordinator, I, I think now is, is a great time. And, um, you know, it doesn't sound like he's going to be one of those guys to worry about leaving in three to four years. I really don't, um, you know, not just because of his age, but I think because of, you know, just the loyalty that he has in his guys, you know, there were a couple there were a couple of parents that were in that spaces too. You know, Noah Sewell's dad was in there. Um, Keon Ware Hudson's dad was in there. They were saying that he recruited their kids to Georgia. And, you know, he seemed like a very loyal family guy. Um, and it just seems like everybody would run through a wall for him. That was kind of the, kind of the main, um, you know, thing to get out of that. So uh, I think this is a huge, huge hire. I think he's, um, you know, a, a very passionate coach from what I've seen. Um, and he gets, he gets the most out of everybody. I mean, you, you think about Georgia's defense, you think about like, you know, the defensive line and the linebackers and the success that they've had up front, but really it's at every level. Like everybody 
plays just elite football on that defense from the starters to, you know, the next man up. So I'm excited to see, you know, this defense be even more utilized because, I mean, you've seen – we've talked about it all season long, especially in the last couple of weeks. There have been peaks for this Oregon defense. There have been moments where it looks dominant and then others where it just kind of looks lost, um, those Utah, Utah games specifically. So I think you're going to see – I think it was granted we were going to see improvement anyway because of how much, um, you know, how much youth is on the defensive side. But given someone of his um, experience and success and who he's able to develop and recruit, um, I mean, at Memphis, he was, um, he was able to recruit a lot of their guys too. And Memphis was uh, playing really good football with Mike Norvell. So um, I, I don't think you have to worry about him as just more of a defensive guy. He could recruit offensive players too brought Antonio Gibson and Anthony Miller to Memphis, plenty of guys to Georgia as well. Um, a lot of those running backs, you know, the tight ends, Brock Bowers. So um, he's an elite recruiter, an elite coach, um, and just a fantastic hire by this Oregon administration. Yeah, so we're definitely going to have to, you know, I don't think, I don't really think it makes sense to, you know, grade hires, but obviously we're going to be giving our, our thoughts here. Um, Want to get some of your guys' questions. This question is from, uh, Amarable, hopefully I'm saying that right. How long will he stay? I think I'm not really concerned about that right now. You know, obviously a lot of fans are thinking about this. A lot of Oregon fans after uh, Willie Taggart and Mario Cristobal both bolted for for jobs back in their native Florida. As as far as I'm concerned, there's practically no no such thing as longevity in coaching for for uh, you know having a head coach uh, in college football. You know, people leave all the time. I mean, Brian Kelly was at Notre Dame for a long time, but then. You know, LSU came calling and he left. Um, Jimbo Fisher, now at AM, he was at Florida State for quite a while. So I think those are examples you can point to, but just with the way that the college football landscape is is shifting, I feel like that's not really, that's going to become a, a thing of the past. Um, and I just, I really like that they they bet on the upside rather than going with, you know, a known commodity, which, which can understandably be some cause for concern. But I'm really happy about that. And then now the biggest question uh, is is going to be the offensive coordinator hire, right? I think that's got to be his first hire because anytime you have a defensive guy become your head coach, then um, you know whoever's running the offense is going to have to be that much stronger of a candidate. I feel like. Yeah, and I think we've talked about it a little bit with um, just the amount of talent that's on offense too that was not you know utilized to its full potential either. So I think given how many pieces that are going to be there that are still looking to you know, kind of get their piece of the pie. I think, yeah, like you said, this is going to be huge for, for landing to prioritize. Um, I, I do think that Chip Kelly shouldn't be out of the running for offensive coordinator. Um, I, I do think that he could get the most out of those guys as well. A lot of people are talking about Joe Brady. I would probably prefer um, Joe Brady for an offensive coordinator job, given his NFL experience as well. That's, a, I would say, a little bit more successful than what Chip Kelly had. Um, so I would probably go Joe Brady. I, I highly, highly doubt Lane Kiffin would, would take an offensive coordinator job. I think that would be a step down from, from being an SEC head coach. So I feel like you could probably rule him out. Um, but I think Brady and, and Chip Kelly would be there. I would also go Pitt's wide receiver coach, Brandon. That's Harris. what I was just thinking. Yeah. I've been reading a lot about him watching film on, you know, how he's been doing things, um, throughout his career. I, I forget where he coached before where he was more of the play caller, but, um, I mean, he is such a, a brilliant young mind. And, uh, you know, obviously Pitt's wide receivers, they had the Bolitnikoff Award winner and Jordan Addison, just a prolific passing offense. So uh, I, I love what I've seen and read about of him. And I think he would be a perfect fit. I feel like he could kind of be that Chip Kelly guy that you just get that, you know, the 50 points a game. You don't know what you're going to get. You know, everybody eats kind of offense. Yeah, I think that I like all those names that you mentioned. I think that. Uh, you know, Chip, having bringing Chip back as an OC isn't the worst idea. Um, just because you know, I think that it it could be time for him maybe just to to take a step back and and you know see that maybe it's not it's not in the cards for him to to run you know a whole program. Like how 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 much better could he be if he was just focusing on the offense because that's what he knows best. Um, but at the same time, I think that there's still that reasonable concern, you know, how much of an edge does he have on, on the college football, uh, you know, the game of college football and, and what is he going to do to, to tweak things? Um, I think that we definitely, I think you still want to see 
some really big bodies in the trenches, whether it be offensive or defensive line. Um, I think there's definitely a lot more work to do um, as far as the defensive line goes, but you have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of reasons to be confident when you just look at some of the, some of the people that they have on the Georgia defense. And I think it's, it's worth mentioning here. I'm, I'm not saying nor should anybody expect Oregon to be Georgia's defense this year. Well, when, when the season comes around next year, you know, there's going to be, we got to temper expectations. Maybe they could be sure, but like that is a tremendous ask. Like this was a absolutely historic Georgia defense, but just to, to that point, look at some of the, the people that he was able to develop at Georgia uh, on his defense, you know, you look at uh, Jordan Davis, big, big defensive lineman. My God, that guy's huge. Won the Outland Trophy Award and the Bednarik Award. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, Outland Trophy Award going to the nation's most outstanding interior lineman, whether that be offense or defense. Um, and then the Bednarik Award going to the most outstanding defensive player in college football. But the distinctions don't stop there. You look back a level on the defense, N'Kobe Dean winning in the Buckus Award for the best linebacker in college football. You just see everything that he's done, and there's definitely um, a lot of reason to, to be optimistic. But um, I think that I'm really looking for, for him to to address the defensive line. Like That's going to be the, the biggest position, I think. One of the biggest positions. I mean, we can, we can get into that a little bit later, but um, – I know we were kind of just talking about uh, offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator. So just wanted to make sure we address that. Yeah. I think a uh, defensive coordinator is going to be interesting too, because it depends on if Dan Lanning is going to be calling plays. Um, that's what he was doing at Georgia. I don't believe he probably would. Um, you know, obviously he'll have a, a defensive coordinator or like a co-defensive coordinator who will probably be drawing up the plays and, um, you know, practicing with the guys, that kind of thing. Cause there are a lot of, you know, coaches that call you know, that are head coaches that call plays as well. Um, so that's, that's definitely one thing to keep in mind is if that's going to be his, um, you know, kind of role. Yeah. So, you know, I think that it'd be good for, for him to, to have a, a little bit of a, I don't want to say completely hands-off approach on offense, but, you know, I think that that could be one of the benefits of this hire is we don't see what, kind of what we saw with, with Cristobal being stubborn to, to let his coordinators do their thing. Um, Cause a lot of people were obviously pretty frustrated about that, but I saw another, um, another good question. Let me see here. Um, hold on. Ah, dang it. I saw a good one. Hang in there, folks. All right, we already talked about the OC. Um, all right, here's one. Michael Lara asks, as great as a DC he is, is this a gamble since he has no head coaching experience? Absolutely, 100% it, it's a gamble. But I think it's a gamble that that you have to take. Um, I'd much rather, I, I was thinking throughout the whole process, I'd, rather, I'd much rather Oregon take a risk and then have it pay off versus, uh, you know, bringing in a guy who's a much safer option and then just setting the program back and potentially, you know, winning like eight or nine games uh, a year. I think when you take, when you, I mean, we don't know the contract details yet, but I feel like if you take a gamble like this, you take a risk on a head coach, then you'll know within, you know, two years or whatever it is, if, if he's going to be the right guy. And if not, you move on. Yeah. I think there's going to be a ton of pressure given the fact that he has never been a head coach before. Um, and given the success that that defense has had. But yeah, like you said, I I was really starting to feel like it was going to be a Chip Kelly or a Justin Wilcox. And I wrote about this earlier this week. Like, I just feel like a hire like that, like you said, I feel like it would be settling. Um, you know, I, I don't feel like it would be a jump um, to take to try to get this program to where it should be to a national championship caliber. Because we talked about it. I mean, Cristobal had the program you know, recruiting at the highest level possible. And obviously they were close to the college football playoff multiple times, but I think a risk need to be taken. I think Lane Kiffin would have been a risk and, a, and definitely um, probably more unrealistic than a lot of people were believed, to, um, you know, that reports were saying. I don't think he was as available as many people were thinking. Um, but I, I do think that Dan Lanning, without his head coaching experience, I yes, I absolutely think it's a gamble. But I think it's... Um, you know, given where George is at, the recruiting ability that he has and just the, his ability to get 
players to the NFL at every level. Um, and just, I mean, you look at Twitter, you look at all the Oregon players and the parents, you listen into the spaces that are all in on this. I saw somebody say, um, you know, I don't think he can bring momentum. He's unproven. I, I do think that he can bring some momentum um, in recruiting and, you know, on the field. I, I'm all in on on his ability to recruit and keep that going. Um, Will Cox or Chip Kelly, I don't think would have been able to do that. I think there would have been a drop off um, on the recruiting trail if we would have brought if we would, if Chip Kelly or Justin Wilcox were the guy. Um, Dan Lanning is as good a recruiter as there is, especially, you know, look where he's been. He's been in the southeast, which is where Oregon's been trying to get and have had some success. And I think his ability to recruit down there, that's that's huge for Oregon. Yeah, I think that I mean I'm I think that the the recruiting emphasis is is obviously super important, but at the same time I feel like recruiting it's not absolutely everything. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I think that who are we to say that that Wilcox or Kelly wouldn't recruit? I mean, I think that was a, a lot of people thought that if they had gone that direction that that might have been the case, but if you just get if you get a guy with, you know, a relentless work ethic like we saw with Cristobal and, you know, you you show him, you know, this is the this is kind of how we work things, which is going to be interesting to see kind of the carryover that we see from the previous staff, you know, who, who stays and who goes. Um, I think that, you know, you can, you can make a good recruiter. I don't think that, um, you know, you, it's absolutely necessary that you have somebody, um, you know, who, who is, who's proven to do it at a high level, but obviously I think that's just a bonus uh, at, at this point. And then I did see, um, that Kirby Smart uh, said something uh, had that statement, so I'm gonna see if I can grab that and and put it up on the screen for the the viewers here. So this is from uh, Brandon Marcello tweeted out the statement um, on Twitter from Kirby Smart, head coach of Georgia. We are so happy for Dan and his family. He and Sophia have been an important part of our Bulldog family for the last four years, and we thank them for all they did for Georgia football and the Athens community. Opportunities like this are a testament to a successful program. While he will coach with us for the upcoming college football playoff, we will move forward with Glenn Schumann and Will Muschamp as co-defensive coordinators. Dan and I are both looking forward to preparing for the CFP. That coming from, again, Georgia head coach Kirby Smart. So, yeah, it's, uh, that, I mean, that's a, a notable update right there is that he's uh, he's still going to coach with uh, the Bulldogs for the, the playoff. Um, you know, they're obviously looking for a, a rematch with the uh, Alabama Crimson Tide. Um which I feel like, I, I don't know, I kind of wish that this was like if they got one and four and then they could just do the rematch and get it over with because then we would have a, a new game uh, either between either Michigan or, or Cincinnati. But, you know, that's just uh, that's just how things go. Let's see. There was a really good question. That I, okay, here we go. Question from Christopher. He said he asks Max, are you thinking that Dan is going to hit recruiting or transfer portal more to fill the team the way he wants it? This is a really interesting question because of the timing of the hire. I feel like just you know off the dome, I feel like you've got to hit the recruiting trail because Oregon's already been so far behind a lot of these other schools um, that have had their you know coaches hired, introduced, in place, and then out on the road recruiting. So I think there's, and that's why I feel like. You can you should prioritize recruiting because the transfer portal guys are going to be there. I mean, the transfer portal is overflowing with with people that are looking for new homes. So I think that you got to get on the recruiting trail um, as soon as you can. Um, I think that's a cool story idea. You know, like the first recruits that he needs to call. You know, obviously try to get get uh, some FaceTime or at least get on the phone with um, you know some of these guys that are still committed in the 2022 class. I believe it was seven decommitments that we've already seen with uh, Kelvin Banks flipping to Texas today uh earlier in the afternoon so i think it makes sense to hit the recruiting trail harder especially because there are a fair amount of guys that are coming back for next year um so initial reaction i'm going to say hit the recruiting trail harder um and then uh after that kind of see what's going on in the transfer portal yeah 100 percent. i agree with that i think given what mario cristobal has been able to build on the recruiting trail and seeing like you said there's seven that have fallen um, and, and left the program for now. I mean, some of them might still be in the mix, but, um, you know, given the fact that seven of them have decommitted this week alone, I think you definitely have to rebuild that, not just for 2022, but, you know, I don't think they have anybody committed for 23. And um, a don't. couple, yeah, a couple of programs have already gotten started. USC's got, you know, a hot start in the 2023 class. So I definitely think, you know, trying to keep that class 
toward the top of the Pac-12 because I believe Stanford, as we stand right now, might have the number one class according to 247, um, which is pretty surprising given the year it's they Stanford? just had. Yeah, I believe I just saw it the other day. I think Stanford's number one um, in the Pac-12. Ow. Oh, okay, yeah. in the Pac-12. Yeah. Not nationally. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I think that recruiting is huge. And I think your point about the transfer portal, like, those guys are going to be there. Yeah, like, I, I agree with that 100%. Um, there's so much talent that's out there. And there are going to be guys that you, you miss on. But I think recruiting, um, you've seen it with Lincoln Riley, with Brian Kelly, Cristobal. I mean, they're getting on the ground and they're they're already going on the recruiting trail. And I think, generally speaking, I think as a head coach, that's probably more your priority um, is the recruiting trail. I think the transfer portal, um, you know, given where we're at right now in the season with, you know, we're preparing for the bowl season. Um, I, I think right now is a, is a more important time to get what you can in recruiting and kind of pick back up where, where you left off when Cristobal had things rolling couple months ago when it looked like it was going to be a full class and now i think oregon's sitting i think it's 13 commits if i'm not mistaken 12 or 13 instead of like the 22 23 they were at yeah it's uh it's been absolutely insane to follow the the fallout on the recruiting trail uh another piece of news that i think is uh worth mentioning here that's kind of come out since the hire um you know we'll, we'll probably wait to see something a little bit more official but Um, It looks like, at least uh, based on this tweet right here, that uh, Oregon safety Bennett Williams is uh, thinking about potentially coming back for for next season. Um, You know, for those of you that aren't watching on the the live show on my YouTube channel. uh, So Bennett had a tweet that he originally sent out on April 25th, 2020. And he said, you will see 2022 NFL draft selection Bennett Williams, DB from the University of Oregon. Relentless work and this team's success going to facilitate this dream I've had since a kid, mark my words. And then uh, in the time since the landing uh, hire um, you know, became official, he quote tweeted it and said 2023 with an asterisk. Asterisk. I think that's how you say it. Wow. That's a, a <laughs> asterisk. Um, so, man, having having a guy like Williams back for, for 2023 would be absolutely huge. Yeah. 2022, I mean, I think- sorry. Yeah, I think that's huge just because of like, I think that tells you just the kind of pull that Dan Lanning has as a head coach. Like, I I feel like if this would have been a different hire, if maybe it was Wilcox or Chip Kelly, would you have seen him come back? Like if it was this defensive minded coach, if it wasn't a defensive minded coach, do you think he would come back? But at the same time, you know, he got injured, wasn't able to finish out that season. I'm sure that had to be weighing on him as well. Um, So it's it's probably not on, on the coaches for sure. But it's definitely exciting to see him back. I mean, he was playing lights out football in that secondary early in the year. Um, so I, I think if he's able to come back and produce what, what he was, you know, anywhere near where he was last year, I think it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch because he really shined. I think, I think 2020, he was really, really solid as well. Very underrated in that secondary, but I think he took a, a huge, huge leap this season. Um, and I'm really sad we didn't get to see him keep improving and keep building off that momentum. Um, but yeah, I think or like everything I've seen from Oregon, um, they were super excited. I just got a reply from Byron Cardwell's mom. Um, she said, we feel good. Oh, we feel so good. So I think everybody's, everybody's excited. I haven't seen any parents that are not liking it, any players that aren't all in. I mean, there's an energy that I have not really felt, um, you know, with this hire. It's really cool to see. It uh, definitely hasn't been the best time to be uh, an Oregon fan <laughs> this past uh, week or so. And I mean, I think that's another thing that we have to, you know, I, I don't want to go, you know, necessarily congratulating Rob Mullins or the athletic department yet because we don't know. There's still so much unknown, right, with this hire. I mean, I'd, I'd say I would congratulate him for for taking a risk, right? You know, taking that gamble that we talked about earlier. I think that that uh, you got to be bold to, to do that. And um, we'll have to see who, who the rest of the staff ends up being. Um, once uh, landing gets here to Eugene, one of the um, one of the questions that we have here um, coming from Alexander. Thanks for the question and thanks for watching. Will he replicate the same success he had at Georgia? I think I've been starting a lot of these. So, do you want to take a stab at this one, Dylan? Well, it's yeah, it's really hard to kind of come out and say yeah because he's making the jump from defensive coordinator to you know, to a head coach at a power five school. So 
Um, I do think that he's going to utilize the defense better. I think you're going to see a little bit more um, of that consistency with the defense. Now, obviously, injuries were you know, a huge uh, hindrance to that. I, I think you can't really have too much of a consistency when so many of your starters are on the sidelines. But um, I, I think over time, I think you're going to see, you know, this Oregon program be where it should be. And I, I don't I don't say that just because, like, you know, it, it's a spur of the moment thing. Everybody's excited. I'm excited. But I do think that he is a great hire in that he has so much experience. He has so much knowledge. The defense, like, I just love the way his defense plays and the effort and the schemes. Um, and the one thing that I will say is a lot of people were saying, you know, Alabama gashed this Georgia defense. They didn't play any really solid offense. Um, and even if that were true, I mean, you know, that, that that Georgia defense was just shutting teams out completely. Like teams weren't moving at all on them. I think if they would have played better competition, even I don't think Georgia still would have given up more than 10 points a game. Um, I mean, they were giving up what seven for a whole season up until the Alabama game. Like that's just ridiculous. I don't think I've ever seen that number for a whole season, whole regular season. So um, I think it's going to take some time because obviously he's going to have a whole new head coach. Um, you know, it's a new head coach, whole new coaching staff for the most part, um, a lot of young talent. So it's going to take some time, but I think um, maybe give it a couple years. I think this Oregon team will be back where it should be. Yeah, I think uh, I'm right there with, you know, it's super early to say, and, and like I was kind of saying earlier on the show, uh, this Georgia defense this year is literally like a historic all time defense. So, probably really hard to, to, you know, see them reaching that level of success, at least in the uh, immediate future, especially with guys like Kayvon Thibodeau leaving DJ James entering the transfer portal. I think that that's uh, a, a really big piece of news that, that I was kind of surprised came out when it did um, seeing that I was, I was thinking that maybe a couple more players would, would wait to see maybe players in general would wait to see uh, who the higher ended up being because that, that Oregon secondary, at least, at the cornerback position is, is pretty thin. If, if uh, um, Mikel Wright ends up declaring for the NFL draft, I think that that's uh, something that we wanted to kind of touch on in the future, Dylan, uh, in an episode of the pod or in some stories, you know, who should stay, who should go and kind of give our takes weighing in on, uh, you know, the NFL futures or, you know, maybe another year of college for, for some of these guys. Cause you have, uh, you know, James was the starter right alongside Mikel Wright. And then you have, uh, fortunately, if, if Wright does end up leaving or either way, Right now, um, you have Dante Manning and Triquas Bridges having played a lot of snaps this year um, for the Ducks. So that definitely gives me a little bit more confidence there. Um, so I don't know if he'll be able to replicate the success at, at, at Georgia. Um, I think that he's going he's going into a, a really good situation as far as the talent uh, that he has on, on defense. Um, but we also still have to see kind of what the roster is ultimately going to look like Um once, uh, once things, uh, end up, you know, all those decisions have been made. Uh, let's see here. DR says you're not going to get recruits like Georgia recruits are not going to leave that far from home. Most of Georgia players are from the South. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally see your point. It's a fair point, but if there's one massive lesson that we learned from the Mario Cristobal era, it's that you can go into the South and you can recruit. So that's why it's going to be so important to see what kind of staff he builds out after, you know, you look at um, this is, I feel like a perfect example of why I think that it's so important for the Ducks to hang on to Brian McClendon since he's another elite recruiter. And uh, you know, he obviously has some sec roots from uh, his time at Georgia as well as at South Carolina. So, I mean, you're looking at top five, maybe top three recruiting classes for Georgia on a consistent basis. And, you know, Oregon's not, Oregon hasn't been in that territory that's what they needed to, to, I've said for a while, I'm pretty sure that I think that's the area that they need to get into consistently in that top five, just so you're loading your roster with the best players in the country. Um, but yeah, I think that they can definitely go into the South and uh, they've proven that, you know, under the crystal ball era. So I think it'll be, it'll be big for him to, to get back into the South uh, with some of these uh, targets. You know, I feel like, you know, you look at a guy in the South, like, like TJ Dudley, I think he's, probably off the board now uh, for Oregon, uh, especially with uh, Ken Wilson taking the head coaching job at uh, Nevada, but just kind of wanted to give some recruiting thoughts here. Cause I know that uh, the ducks definitely want to get back in the South, uh, you know, here in the future. Yeah. I mean, in years past, Oregon 
really wasn't getting guys, not too many um, elite guys out of the South and really anywhere, you know, East of the Mississippi. Um, and yeah, Cristobal was able to bring that um, completely. I mean, this 2022 class, there were, there were so many guys who were not from the West coast. It was probably majority guys, not from the West coast. Um, and that was really impressive. And from what I've read about Dan Lanning, um, so far, he's one of those guys who's not just a product of the program that he's in, not a product of Kirby Smart um, as a recruiter. He, like he himself is a very, very good recruiter. Um, you know, a lot of the parents that were, um, you know, fortunate enough to have kids that were recruited by so many Power Five schools, like they, they were still in communication with Dan Lanning even after the kids committed to Oregon and Utah and USC and you know all those. Um, and they all have just very great things to say about Dan Lanning, not just not just as a coach, not just as a recruiter, but as a guy. I mean, he's a family man. He's, um, you know, a diehard football addict. I mean, he's he's a guy who's all in. He's um, all in on his guys, all in on his program. So I think he's going to have, you know, I think he's going to have a hold on recruiting. I think the momentum's not going to fall off too far. Um, I think he's, he's as good a recruiter that could have, you know, taken this job as a head coach. Yeah, totally agree. Um, let's see what the, the next question or comment that we had here coming from Mikey G. Uh, Cause this was asked, I believe uh, in, you know, earlier comments and questions. So I'm getting these as fast as I can guys. Uh, he may not be the mastermind of the UGA offense, but he certainly understands what it takes to execute at a championship level. I couldn't have said it better myself. You know, you look at some of his previous stops, obviously the Alabama one is the biggest one that, uh, you know, comes to mind. Um, it's just so crazy how so many people who have been through that program end up getting head coaching jobs. You know, if, if the Ducks had indeed hired Lane Kiffin, then that would have been another person that came from the um, from the Saban tree. Um, but I think obviously being at Alabama, it's always good. I, I wonder how much weight that really carried because, you know, that's obviously the gold standard of football that we've come to learn. And then where do you go after that? Then he went to um, well, actually, I don't want to say the timeline. He might have gone to Memphis, but um, I think that actually was where he went. So I just don't have it in front of me. But you have Bama and Georgia background. I think that obviously helps a tremendous amount. Um, so he knows he's been around winners and he knows what it takes to win. And I think that that should be a definitely a reason for optimism. Yeah, I mean, and, and Georgia's still in it this year. They could end up the national champions this year. Um, so that's even more experience right there. But um, when he was at Alabama, I believe he was just a, I think he was a GA, which, you know, that's not a slight on him. I mean, obviously that's, you're still around the program. You're still around the coaching staff. That's um, as good of experience as you can have being in that program. So um, I, I think given what we've seen at Georgia and given the, what he can do, um, I think this is as high of a ceiling for an Oregon defense as I can remember. Like that, de that 2019 defense was one of the best. I know there were like mid, to late 2000s defenses that were elite as well, like the Haloti Nada era. Um, but that 2019 defense was one of the best Oregon defenses I can remember. I feel like it's ceiling with the amount of talent coming in and already on the roster is, you know, double that. I think we could see an elite Oregon defense. And obviously the competition between the Pac-12 and the SEC is so different. I mean, you have so many Pac-12 schools that, you know, could put up 30 a game, um, 28 a game. And so... You know, I mean, the SEC has a lot of high-powered offenses. I mean, Tennessee had a really good offensive year. Um, LSU was kind of all over the place, but they were able to put up some points. Um, and obviously, Alabama did what they did. Arkansas was one, and Georgia shut out Arkansas completely. So I think this is, you know, he's going to get everybody involved. And I, you've already seen that on Twitter. He's going to get everybody locked in. I think he's going to win over the locker room. I don't think that's, um, you know, I, I think I saw a question in there. Can he win over the locker room? Um, I think that's an easy yes already from what we've seen. So, um, yeah. Did you drop something back there? <laughs> no, it was one of my roommates in the kitchen. My, my room is oh. right by the right by the kitchen. So, <laughs> apologies for that. Okay. Um, do you have anything else you wanted to say on that? No, I, I think that was pretty much it. I think I covered it. All right. Question from Michael O'Brien. Thanks for the question. Uh, any deets on the length pay for the contract? Any guesses? Uh, we don't have any of that uh, information firsthand right now, um, you know, seeing that the university themselves haven't actually announced it, but our sources have confirmed that. 
um, with Ducks Digest. But I think that this is going to be the, one of the you know biggest questions. There's so many follow-ups that obviously come after this hire. You know, who are the other coordinators going to be? What kind of? I, I don't think it'll be. It, and it shouldn't really be along the um, you know the lines of what they were going to offer Mario reportedly, right? You know that ten year, eighty five million dollar contract to to stay with Oregon. It just doesn't make sense considering that he's a first year head coach. Um, you know why would you give him a contract that crazy? Which I think is a good thing because if you give him a smaller contract, then you'll have more money to uh, you know go into that assistant coaching pool. Um, and hiring a big name like this is only going to attract more big names, I think. Although I think because he hasn't been a head coach before that could kind of play into it, but because you hire a big name like this, who, who's been in the sec and, and achieved uh, tremendous success at the highest level, I think that's going to attract more big names, uh, more big coordinators that, uh, that he wants to bring in. Yeah. I, I, to add on to that, I haven't seen anything about his contract either. Um, I haven't even seen any guesses from anybody. So um that is not anything that's been reported yet. I don't think um, that probably won't be reported for a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it should be a crazy long deal. I mean, you've seen Lincoln Riley, which I don't think that's still official yet, but his was like a 10 year deal. Brian Kelly's was close to a 10 year deal. I think Cristobal's was as well. Um, and those are coaches, you know, those have been head coaches for a while. Brian Kelly for years and years and years, Lincoln Riley, Mario Cristobal, a little bit more. Um, recent when they started but um yeah i don't think it's going to be anything more than probably like a three four year deal um that's what i was thinking kind of around there yeah because i think it it keeps the pressure down too uh for him i mean if you give a guy you know a 10-year deal out of the gate as your first you know head coaching contract i mean that's a that's a hell of a lot of pressure for someone who's who's just getting going and has to build his like you said he has to build his coaching staff and all that stuff so I, I think a, a pretty small deal, like kind of what we saw with Oregon and Cristobal um, and just kind of extending it year after year. Um, I feel like we could see something like that. And then once he proves that he is the guy, um, I wouldn't be surprised if they if they give him that, you know, 10 year, 80 plus million dollar deal. And I'm sure by the time we were, were at that point, you know, contracts will be even crazier. I'm sure we'll see some coaches in the hundred millions, but obviously it depends on what he does. Um, but I, I think, yeah, you start small just try to ease him into it. Cause I don't think he did, you know, he's not a head, he hasn't been a head coach yet. So I don't think he's someone that you can give, you know, a max deal to, I mean, this isn't, you know, we don't want to, to dive into a reference here. I, you don't want to fork over money to a Chandler Parsons, I guess was the first name I thought of, or like a Brock Osweiler. Um, you don't want that situation. Yeah. And I think another, uh, another dynamic kind of that comes to mind with me or another situation with this is, um because we were talking about or i was saying in my last you know point about him attracting uh other big names to be his coordinators because he's so young it's kind of going to be different i feel like than if you brought in someone who's a little bit more experienced because um you know a lot of fans had kind of been thinking okay we'll bring someone else in or i guess the ideal situation really would have been to bring somebody else in who can bring in strong coordinators and then while they're the head coach court them and you know help develop them as coaches so that if the head coach gets hired away again um then that they they can promote from within right you'd look at when when urban meyer retired ryan day was already on the staff um i'm trying to think of other ones uh when brian kelly left marcus freeman was already on the staff so that's why it is really important and i think we've said it multiple times on the show you know sure the the initial hire is exciting but we really do have to see how he builds out his staff, but because he's so young, I don't think you necessarily have that situation where, um, and I'm not to say that he can't, but it doesn't seem as likely because he's so young for him to bring in another coordinator and, and court him and develop him to be the next head coach. Yeah. I don't think that would probably be a priority of his. I think from what I've heard, it sounds like he would be a guy who wants to, you know, stick around. It doesn't sound like he's a guy who would jump from place to place. Like he seems um, like he's probably here to stay. Now, obviously that's a lot of, just reports and things flying around and you know the little that i heard from his brother in the in those twitter spaces last night so just a lot of things floating around about him but um i i think the reason why i think that the coaching staff build is so important is just because of when i was talking to so many recruits over the summer when they were on their visits so many of them were saying you know i really didn't get to talk to coach cristobal so much like he was there of course he was you know talking with my family and stuff but um it was more so 
our the position coach, the defensive coordinator, the offensive coordinator, like I feel like they're more involved in the one on one stuff because, you know, that's their position more so. And Cristobal obviously was heavily involved. I mean, that's that's no slight to him. He was heavily involved. And, you know, every recruit had great things to say. But I just think that those coordinators put so much more into recruiting because, it, you know, everything on the table for the head coach. So, I mean, your offensive line coach, I think, is going to be one of the most important ones, given you've lost Kelvin Banks and you've lost Cameron Williams. Um, there's still going to be a lot of veterans on the offensive line next year, but still a lot of youth to develop as well. Um, I think, obviously, offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, huge. Um, and then we have to see who else might follow Cristobal. I don't think any of that's really official yet. Um, I, I think Mirabal is really the only one that I think is official as of right now. Have you heard anything else on that? No, nothing new on that. But that was probably like the, you know, like we've kind of been saying, probably the most obvious one just because they, you know, both, I think they both went to the same high school out there in Miami. And that's kind of been his right hand man for, for the longest time. Um, it's going to be interesting to see if the, if the Ducks can um, hang on to McClendon, like we already mentioned. Um, because it looked, there were reports out that, um, that Mario was trying to go after, you know, Mastro and, and some of the other, some of the other big, um, you know, names on the staff. But I think that, that, yeah, the, I can't remember what my next point was going to be, but um, yeah, that was a, a cool question that inspired some, some good conversation. Um, let's see. How crazy do you think it's going to be that, that this is Oregon's first opponent next year, Georgia, <laughs> Georgia, Oregon, first game of the 2022 season oh you had to be, you had to know that dan lanning was thinking that as the negotiations were going like man i have to i have to face these guys on the other sideline um i guess thankfully for them and for him it's not at georgia i mean it's it's in atlanta it's a neutral site game which is a lot of malarkey if you ask me that it's in atlanta but um, yeah no not really <laughs> yeah i think it's gonna be really cool though i mean it adds to the storyline it adds to you know the pressure and it adds to recruiting too. I mean, you know, I, I feel like for Oregon, if you're bringing guys in trying to get them to come to Oregon, they're like, hey, you get to play a team like Georgia that if you beat them, you're right there in the college football playoff, just like what we had with Ohio State. There were a lot of guys that uh, we're talking about. We're super excited to play Georgia that I was talking to for 2022. They're like, yeah, they're on the schedule. Um, I, I can't wait to potentially play them. Um, so, I mean, when you have a schedule like that and you have an opponent like that, it's not just huge for for Dan Lanning, but it's huge for the program too. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't say expect Oregon to, uh, you know, expect Dan Lanning to know everything about what George is going to do and things like that. Cause obviously they're going to bring in a new defensive coordinator and some things are going to shift there and they'll have different talent. It's going to be a lot of guys going to the NFL for sure. Um, so, but I think having that insight and being there for those three, four years, uh, that's definitely going to help. And, and knowing what Kirby smart likes to do and the offense likes to do, that's definitely going to be a huge help. Yeah. And, you know, P, you know, I'm sure Kirby smart knows that, and, you know, he's going to throw some changes into the game plan. Uh, you know, once, once this actually becomes, you know, like they're, uh, they're doing it, uh, or sorry, once the, once they, you know, are pre taking their preparations a little bit differently since landing's over here now, um, saw, a, a good, uh, a good comment here. This is from, uh, Trivi eight should hire Dante Williams to his staff for West coast recruiting ties. I love this. Um, you know, obviously a lot of people know Dante Williams for the time that he spent in Eugene as the cornerbacks coach for Oregon. And I mean that, yeah, the, the ties he has to the LA area is going to be huge. Uh, you know, that's obviously the, the biggest area that, that Lane's going to have to prioritize. You know, if I'm kind of thinking about it, you look at obviously in state, you got to keep the best players home and, uh, Oregon's not like a lot of these other States that don't have a lot of top tier elite can't miss guys every year on a consistent basis. Um, you know, that's no slight to the state or the players. That's just, you know, the, the way things are. So he's, he's got to know, and I bet he does know that, you know, if you want to win the Pac-12, you've got to win LA and you got to go in there and get those, uh, you know, win those recruiting battles um, between, uh, you know, really everybody. I mean, obviously SC is going to have a stake in any player that's coming out of LA now with Lincoln Riley and his reputation as a recruiter. Um, and then you have people from the SEC and, you know, your Clemsons and your Ohio States and your Michigans trying to get in there too. So that's going to be huge. And then I think, you know, going into a state like Arizona, which has been tremendously talented these past couple cycles, you look at a guy like Anthony Lucas. I wonder, I mean, he just dropped his top five and he cut Oregon out of it. 
I think yeah. he's probably going to end up at a and but I wonder if a hire like this gives them some kind of a chance to get back in the picture. Um, but, you know, kind of like we've said earlier with, with him going to be when he, since he's going to be coaching Georgia in the playoff, it's going to be pretty tough for, for them to get, um, you know, too much momentum on, on the recruiting trail. But I think that just having a name in place now is going to be, you know, a, a big relief for a lot of people. Yeah, especially given where we're at with early signing day, a couple of days out now, I think this is a perfect time to do it. Um, you know, and obviously, I don't think Dan Lanning is going to be coming down for a bit just because he's coaching in the college football playoff. That's been confirmed. Um, so he probably won't he won't be in town for um, early signing day, I would I would assume. Um, but going back to the question about Dante Williams, I don't know if Rod Chance is following Cristobal. That was one of the names I really wanted to know if he was going to follow. Because he has true, because he has four ties. That's true. Yeah, and so um, that's that's a huge thing to keep an eye out on. He's been with Oregon for a bit too, um, but I think if if he does end up going to Miami, I think Dante Williams is absolutely the first person you call because um, there was a lot of NFL players that that came from Oregon while he was their defensive backs coach, and you know were recruited by him uh, as as their cornerbacks coach. So yeah, I mean he's a phenomenal cornerbacks coach. I mean, I know a lot of players were really upset when we ended, when he ended up leaving. I believe it was to Cal was the first place he left, if I'm not mistaken. Um, or was it USC? For Dante Maybe Williams? They, yeah. Yeah, USC. That's right. Yeah, I was thinking of somebody else that went to Cal. Um, but yeah, I, I think Hayward. a lot of... That's right. Yeah, Hayward. Um, I think a lot of people were upset when Williams left um, just because of the kind of coach and, and person that he is. So if you're able to bring him back and like you were talking about with Dante Manning and, and Tricrest Bridges and a lot of those young corners that are going to be coming in. That's, that's huge for him to be able to come in and develop guys like that. Cause we know he can. Definitely. Um, let's see here. Um, um, hmm, let's see. I don't even remember what I was, uh, what I was going to say, but yeah, um, yeah, we got we got a pretty good amount of people in here. Thank you guys for for showing up for this uh, this higher you know this emergency episode of the podcast. Um, I'm trying to think of what other points that I could that we could maybe get into here. Um, you know, we're looking ahead to the bowl game. I think. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, this could kind of tie into it and the the quarterback situation with Oregon. You know, obviously they have their head coach in place now, so that is a major check mark. You know, check that box. You know, get it off your to do list that's huge but i think the next obviously a, apart from the staff you got to see what the quarterback situation is looking like uh going into next year uh after crystal ball left ty thompson tweeted that he was locked in um on twitter so <clears throat> take that for for what it's worth i figure we've probably learned that social media doesn't mean a whole lot um but you know just gotta you know continue to monitor that situation but uh if i'm morgan i'm i'm throwing uh i'm throwing tie in at quarterback in, in the Oklahoma game because you got to get him ready. Uh, that'll be his fourth game of the year. So he'll be able to keep, hang on to his red shirt. Um, but, you know, kind of just hammering home the point that uh, there's not really a whole lot to gain by uh, putting Anthony Brown in this uh, Alamo Bowl. Yeah. I mean, it would be his last game anyway. And I, I don't feel like we talked about it a little bit before. Like it, there's no chance that he's probably going to opt out for any reason. Um, I, I think you, yeah, you have to go for Ty Thompson here. You have to get him that experience. Um, I guess it's a good thing that it's not a huge bowl game because he doesn't have as much pressure to go out there on a Rose Bowl or something like that. I mean, Alamo Bowl is is not a mediocre bowl game by any means, um, but I, I definitely think that you have to get him some experience against a really good team. Because um, yeah, what else? What else do you have to prove by putting Anthony Brown out there? I mean, he's you're not going to get anything out of him that you know you haven't seen before. Um, I think it, this is the time to see what you have at, with Ty Thompson. Um, and even even if they go with um, with Anthony Brown again, which, you know, I, I feel like that was a crystal ball thing, him being super, um, I don't want to say stubborn. I've tried not to say that a couple of times, but I guess faithful. You can say Anthony that. Brown. Yeah, I, I'm trying not to be too harsh, but um, I feel like a lot of the comments will do that for me. <laughs> but I think that, you know, Ty Thompson has – has to get going. I think we've only really seen him for what, two, three drives this whole season. Um, if he's expected well, we played the to second it. half against Stony Brook. Oh, that's right. Yeah. It was more so of that was half, a, so. a little bit more of a sample size, but yeah, not, not very much to your point. Yeah. So I think to get him out there to start a game like this, to get him going with, with the ones and 
to get them out there on a field on a big stage. I think that's huge because you throw them out there next year. I mean, you're talking it's Georgia. The defense probably isn't, you know, going to be too much of a step down from what it was. I mean, I, there's going to be a lot of missing pieces going to the NFL, new coordinator, still going to be a Georgia defense. And they're still in Atlanta, 90% Georgia fan base, I'm sure. I mean, it's going to be a ruckus environment. It's going to be a really tough challenge for someone who's never started a game. So I think you have to get him going or whoever you want to get going now to to get him ready for that. I mean, the Alma Bowl is not going to be, you know, Atlanta with that fan base. I mean, it's not going to be this sold out huge ruckus crowd, but um, it, it's going to be a huge environment. It's going to be, you know, a big opportunity for him to, to see where he's at developmentally and um, mentally with the program, the playbook and, and everything like that. So um if I'm if I'm landing, if I'm Joe Moorhead, since he's still going to be coaching, um, and Brian McClendon, who's going to be the interim coach, yeah, definitely. I wouldn't even think twice about putting Ty Thompson, Butterfield, Ashford, all of them. I mean, <laughs> whoever you want to, whoever you want to put out there, I, I want to see what we got. Yeah, and then one of the the comments I saw in the chat was, uh, you know, kind of along the lines of the first call that he should make uh, was uh, to quarterback Dylan Gabriel. What do you think about that? I feel like that'd be a, a pretty good, uh, pretty good addition. Because even if, even if they do, it's you know, it's looking like I don't want to put anything out there that isn't confirmed or one hundred percent true. But let's just assume for for the sake of this podcast that that Ty Thompson's going to be back next year. Um, I think that if he gets hurt, you don't have anybody approving behind them, so behind yeah. him. So I think um, you got to try to hit the portal and uh, bring in uh, bring in another quarterback, maybe someone who's yeah, more I experienced. Think- Absolutely. I think Dylan Gabriel is a guy who um, has definitely produced at a high level. He had some really, really good seasons at UCF. Um, This past year got injured, so we really didn't get to see a whole lot of him. Um, But that is definitely a a pass-heavy offense. Um, So we've definitely seen a lot of tape of him uh, as a passer. Uh, Pretty mobile guy. So I I think he's still got a couple years of eligibility left. I don't think he's a grad transfer. If I'm not mistaken, I believe he's got a couple years. Um, so that would, I, I think I would take that. I, I don't think he's a guy who you would expect the coaching staff to give the job to right away. Um, like, you know, with Anthony Brown, when he came in, I feel like most people thought that he was going to get the job because of that experience. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I'm back and forth on it because I do get the point of if, you know, God forbid, if something happened to, Whoever is the starter next year, you don't have anybody. I, I do get that. But I, at the same time, it's like you have to kind of put trust in your quarterback that's been growing on, on the bench and in practice and stuff like that. But at the same time, you want to give him somebody to learn from, too. He had Anthony Brown this year. Um, you want to give him somebody that is probably a, a better quarterback, has, a, has been on bigger stages. Um, I think UCF has been on some pretty big stages. Looks like the crystal ball right now for Gabriel is UCLA, which is – pretty interesting um but yeah i I think gabriel would be a a really nice fit and i don't think he's a guy who i would expect oregon to just hand down the job to given what you know the potential that this oregon quarterback room already has yeah no i'm i'm right there with you i think when i googled gabriel just to try to see kind of what was going on i think there was a report that showed up that said he was spotted at ucla practice so that might be you know there's always there's always reports about people being interested in this school or that school but as far as I'm concerned, I feel like when you visit a school, then that really shows, you know, how how much interest you actually have, you know, to, to make that trip, especially since he was coming uh coming out of um you know Florida, the Florida area. So that's that's pretty big. Right. I do know that um I was expecting him to go to Ole Miss because his former quarterbacks coach and offensive coordinator, I think for a year um, at UCF, Jeff Levy, he was at Ole Miss. And Corral is probably going to go to the NFL. But now Levy, I believe, is going to Oklahoma to be their offensive coordinator. And they've already got Caleb Williams. So um, I I feel like that's off the table. Um, So, yeah, I feel like uh, Oregon would probably be a pretty good fit for Dalen Gabriel. Um, I I really hope it's not Spencer Rattler. Um, So I I think Gabriel would be a nice backup for a guy like Ty Thompson if he does indeed come back and, and is expected to be the starter. I just want to see Oregon develop a quarterback. I want to see, um, you know, an offensive coordinator that has experience with um, young quarterbacks and kind of developing them into um, elite caliber quarterbacks. Like I I feel like Chip Kelly could do that. I feel like Joe Brady would be an even better 
as an offensive coordinator to to potentially groom a guy like um, like Ty Thompson as a future, you know, kind of program leading quarterback, the face of the program. Yeah. So we'll, you know, we'll, um, yeah, gosh, that quarterback, that quarterback room and the quarterback question is just going to be so, so pivotal because all the, all the best teams in college football have, you know, difference makers at quarterback, you know, say, say what you will about Stetson Bennett, you know, being a, a former walk on and Juco guy, but he's put, he's put Georgia in, in you know, the position to have success, at a lot of uh, you know points this season, so I think that that's uh, that's pretty big. Somebody, uh, I saw somebody bring up Jamie Chadwell, the uh, head coach at Coastal Carolina. That would be a great one. Um, I oh, for OC? yeah, because I think McCall has definitely um, become an, an NFL caliber quarterback. He got hurt at the end of this year, but I, yeah, Jamie Chadwell would be great. Yeah, because we were talking about him, I think, on on the last episode of the pod as far as just, you know, having um, – let me see if I can look up Coastal Carolina's stats this year um, or maybe their ranks. Can go. Yeah, they were definitely up there for a good chunk of the year. And obviously in the Sun Belt, you know, their um, competition isn't as high as others, other candidates. But, um, yeah, I mean, with he, what he did with that offense and to get them, you know, into the top 20, top 15 in the AP poll, I mean, yeah, he's a phenomenal head coach. Yeah, I think then we're seeing comments too uh, about Joe Brady with with Dante Williams as the defensive coordinator. I'd be pretty down with that. I don't know how much confidence I have with with Dante as a defensive coordinator necessarily, but I feel like it. I, it's interesting that we still don't know if he's going to be on Riley's staff, or maybe he has, but we just don't. We I haven't seen the uh, the update for that. But I think he would be a, a huge addition to to Oregon staff, but. Yeah, let's get back on Jimmy Chabwell and see what we can kind of find here. Um, scoring offense, let's see, through December 4th, so that was a week ago, right, the end of the conference championship weekend. Um, through December 4th, 2021, uh, the number six scoring offense, the Coastal Carolina, what's their mascot? I have Chanticleers. no idea what it is. The yeah, Chanticleers. Chanticleers. Yeah. Heck yeah. On the um, teal field. That's super clean. I, I like watching that a lot, but I would be lying to you if I said that I uh, watched a lot of uh, Coastal Carolina <laughs> football in my uh, in my spare time. I was watching a little bit of Army Navy before this news broke, um, so I'm trying to find the look at the rest of the stats here. Okay, scoring offense. Let's see where are they at. Okay, yeah, sixth in the country, uh, 66 touchdowns. Um, Averaging forty point four points per game, I think that's pretty pretty uh, encouraging. Um, but yeah, I mean, because it's interesting when you look at the the whole head coaching dynamic. Uh, you know, would would he want to leave? You know, looks like uh, John Kane saying that he doesn't think he would leave for a uh, an OC job, but it is at yeah. a better school. You know, higher profile uh, program. Um, let's see. Uh, but yeah, 40.4 points a game is, is definitely uh, a great number that I'm sure Oregon would really like. Cause I feel like you've got to put up 35 points a game, like pretty, pretty consistently. If you want to be able to, to be competitive in these games, the whole, uh, you know, mantra of defense wins championships. I, I think that someone was tweeting at me the other day about that, just kind of, uh, you know, saying defense wins championships, so they should kind of go defensive minded. It was when I put that poll out, I think, about do you want to go offensive minded coach, defensive minded coach for the next Oregon coach. But I feel like just with all the the elite explosive offenses that we've seen, it's really just become, I think, who can score more points, which is, you know, that's how football works. But like just who who can score more points faster and at a higher mm -hmm. clip. Well, yeah, I mean, look at the last few teams that have won the national championship, like Alabama last year, insane offense, LSU a couple years ago, insane offense, all those other Alabama teams with Tua and Jalen Hurts and Clemson with Deshaun Watson, like they were all elite offensive teams that could score, you know, in bunches. So I definitely think you have to kind of get back to that. But that's not to say that defense isn't important. I mean, I think if you have, you know, an elite defense in the Pac-12, it's going to go a long way with, you know, how some of those programs can go off for 30, 40 points. Um, like there's no team, maybe except for Colorado, but in Washington, there's probably no team that I would say like they weren't capable of putting up 30 points a game. Um, but Coastal, one thing that I really like looking at Coastal specifically, they averaged 261 passing yards and 231 rushing yards. So 
um, very balanced. They're very capable of doing both things. They had a, they use their tight ends a lot. Isaiah likely is a future first round, maybe first round pick at tight end at Coastal Carolina. So that gives me hope because I, I know you do as well. Um, share the same thing about um, same point about tight ends. I think this this team has too many t- tight ends to not be using them. So I think if Chadwell was the OC, I definitely think the tight ends would, would get some use for sure. Because Isaiah likely was their their leading receiver. I think he probably leads all tight ends in pretty much every category, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they the tight end is such a cool position to watch. I love how they just have a mix of of all those skills, blocking, catching, running, playmaking in space. And uh, I'm super excited for Terrence Ferguson when I look at uh, names in that oh, yeah. room. Um, let's see what other questions we had here. <clears throat> if they oh, don't, Trey if you McBride. see if if you see any that that you think um, would be interesting, definitely let me know. I have I haven't seen people say they believe Joe Brady's going to Miami. I don't believe that's um, official. I know there was a rumor that came out not too long ago about that this week. Um, I don't know for sure if that's got any traction to it. Um, but I, I definitely think that he's probably going to go back to college, um, to the college level, because the NFL obviously didn't work out um, as well as a lot of people expected. But I, I do think that Joe Brady would be my top choice for OC. Saw somebody say Mark Helfrich. Um, not 100% sure if he'd be willing to jump back to um, to coaching. I, I think he's – I'm not I'm not 100% sure with Helfrich. All right. Um, question from uh, Braden Pap- Pepe. Uh, what kind of East Coast recruiting do you think Lanning could bring to Eugene? Um, you know, East Coast is, is – a is I feel like it's an underutilized uh, talent bed. Um, but when I first think of the ties for landing with recruiting, obviously the the South and Southeast are going to be big with his stops at Bama and Georgia. But since he's from Kansas City, I think that that's a really interesting area that they have to get back to. I've said interesting like 70 times this podcast, <laughs> and I hate it. So we got to get the vocab uh, better, Max. Uh, but yeah, St. Louis – an area in Missouri that is very, very popular. Uh, there were a lot of I. There was one week I remember in this past season when I felt like every, not every, but Oregon was get, sending out tons of offers in Missouri, and uh, the number one slot receiver in the country, Kevin Coleman. Guess where he's from? St. Louis. Missouri. So yeah, so I think that that could really help them get into uh, you know another pipeline state. Uh, Mario did a great job getting them into Arizona. Um, which is huge, you know. Obviously, looking at Ty Thompson, Brandon Buckner, um, Jonah Miller, some some other guys from Arizona. Johnny Johnson is from Arizona, so that's really big. Uh, so I think not so sure about the the East Coast necessarily, but that's kind of another area that uh, that I was thinking about. Uh, and then we have a question here from Gerard Berry, uh, fellow San Jose native. Uh, shout out the 408. I'm not wearing the hat today, but thanks for your question, Gerard. Thanks for coming back to the show. Always cool to see you here. What do you believe Lanning will be able to do for Oregon prior to departing Georgia in January, especially when it comes to keeping key pieces currently at Oregon, recruiting and staffing? This is the million dollar question right now, I feel like, especially since he's going to be coaching uh, Georgia in the, in the playoff. I don't know if he's necessarily, he's probably not going to be able to get on the road recruiting, but he can at least call people and, you know, try to put some people's mind at ease as far as, you know, you're saying, hey, I'm going to be the next guy in place here. Uh, definitely calling up commits. Be like, hey, love to get to know you more. Um, you know, show those commits that you're still interested in them. Uh, and then definitely, I would say, trying to have a conversation as much as you can. I'm, I'm, maybe they'll, like, Zoom the team, like, get the whole team in in uh, one of the meeting rooms and then just have landing, like, on the big screen, you know, addressing the team because I don't know when he's going to be able to – to get to Eugene, but that's kind of what uh, what first comes to mind as far as um, what what landing can do, um, you know, here in the near future to to help Oregon. Um, yeah, it's just that'll be a, a hurdle that they have to deal with with this hire. Yeah, I mean, he's, there's so many things that you have to do when you get started at a new program, but uh, I think the big thing, yeah, it's just starting up that chemistry with the with the team, just getting to know the team, getting to know the recruits, but. I feel like before you get on the ground in recruiting, I feel like you've got to build up that coaching staff because there's really only scraps of it at this point. Um, and then again, it, like we were talking about, it's not even confirmed who's 
still in Eugene and who's going to Miami or elsewhere. Um, you know, Ken Wilson's going to Nevada. Um, Joe Moorhead's going to be off to um, um, Akron. And then Marcel Yates and Tim DeRuiter off to Texas Tech after the bowl game. So um, there's, it's going to be a whole new coaching staff. So I, I think before you kind of get into that recruiting, as important as it is, um, you know, talk to the guys who are already committed, make sure they're, they're good to go for signing day. And then, you know, start interviewing coaches for to get that coaching staff rolling because that's that's you know critically important for to get other guys involved before national signing day in February is to have a coaching staff who can go travel and um, you know go talk to dudes because I think the the bigger your coaching staff is the more you have you know in contact with the more people you have in contact uh, with recruits the better because right now there's there's very few people that are out there and it, of course it helps now to have a head coach to you know, some recruits who are out there are probably feeling a little bit better. Like, okay, it's not up in the air anymore. Um, you know, and, and with so many guys leaving for other jobs, it just, it kind of puts a bad taste in your mouth. If you're, if you're going to Oregon, um, if you're looking at Oregon as a potential new home. So um, you definitely got to get that coaching staff going. I think that's um, one of your top, top priorities, but, you know, talking to the players as well, like you said, um, as early as you can, as soon as it's official, just to, I mean, just to, just to get to know him and just to say, Hey, I'm your guy. This is um, what we're going to do. Here's the plan kind of thing. And just start things from, from square one. One thing that comes to mind uh, for me here, um, probably going to wind down the podcast here relatively soon. I know we've been going for uh, over an hour here, but I think a, a cool question to ask Dylan is because Oregon is hiring a defensive minded coach, as its head coach, what do you think the identity of this program is going to look like come 2022? Well, I don't think that it's going to have a huge step, step down from what you saw from Cristobal with the physicality and the toughness. I think Dan Lanning is going to bring that same mentality. I don't think you're going to see, um, you know, probably what you would have seen with Helfrich and Chip Kelly was really just flash and we're going to outrun you. Like this is a still a very physical minded head coach. Um, and so I, I think you're going to see a lot of that. The trenches, I, th I think, is still going to be a big um, piece of the identity, piece of the puzzle. Um, defensive line, probably more so, because he's a defensive coordinator um, at heart. So um, I think it's it's not going to be a whole lot different. But at the same time, I think you're just going to see a little bit more dominance. I think that's one thing I've, I've heard from some of his pressers is he wants to flat out dominate teams. Um, and I think he understands you know, kind of the top of the top. I mean, you're, you're in the SEC for so long. You understand what the what the competition is like once you get to, you know, the college football playoff and you, you get to those big bowl games. Um, I feel like that's one thing that I really like about this hire is that if Oregon was to get into the college football playoff, I feel better of them going up against a Georgia or an Alabama because of his experience going up against teams like that every year, um, especially with Georgia playing Alabama pretty much annually in the sec championship um so and i mean mario cristobal had that too with his time at alabama but i think as a defensive coordinator as you know someone who recruits in the area i feel like he's got a great understanding of um the top of college football and what it's like to to win and you know just what what it's like to to win i i think that's a, a huge thing i think he's a winner he's a proven winner proven developer um and he's a physical tough-minded coach that i think is going to get the most out of everybody not just the defense yeah I, I like the the physicality that that identity was something that i think really helped oregon um you know just with the the kind of bodies that they brought in the athletes that they brought in uh you want to you know you look at a game like that ohio state game before mario got here i don't think that this roster was was built to be competitive in a game like that because of the guys that he brought in like they really dominated the line of scrimmage so uh, with a guy like Lanning, that that's still going to be, uh, you know, just kind of to give my take on the, the question about the identity, I think that'll still be it. And then um, as far as the offensive identity, what do you think? I don't, I want to, I don't want to pose another question, but it'd be cool. What I wonder what people would think about going under center or like a little bit of under center and shotgun. Cause the, the pistol, I feel like they've, you know, had it in place for a long time now. I guess we'll see what happens when, um, when uh with mastro as far as what he's gonna do um i'm seeing a lot of people in the or not a lot of people but some people in the comments talking about dan mullen as a as a, a, a um 
offensive coordinator candidate. And I think that could be pretty interesting as, uh, you know, he's had a lot of success. Uh, Florida's offense is pretty solid, even though they didn't win a lot of games this year. Um, and maybe he's one of those guys, kind of like we were talking about a chip earlier. Maybe he just needs to kind of see that maybe running a program isn't isn't uh, his cup of tea and, and giving him just a full focus on the offense would be what he needs. Yeah, I think a lot of the candidates that we've talked about, they're a lot better as an offensive coordinator than a head coach. Mullen is definitely one of them. Um, I think Joel Moorhead was kind of the same way. A lot of people were saying the same thing about Moorhead. Like, yeah, he was not a very good head coach. You know, what makes you think he can be the offensive coordinator at a program like Oregon? I think it's simply because they're a better offensive coordinator. I think if you were to bring in Mullen, that would be a much better fit. Um, if you were to bring in Chip Kelly, that would be a better fit. Joe Brady as well. Um, I don't believe Joe Brady's been a head coach before. Um, but I, I think Joe Brady would definitely, you know, bring bring that life back to, to Oregon's offense. But I, I think the one reason why I was thinking Chip Kelly would be okay, because I've been very, very back and forth on Chip Kelly, um, or really any offensive coordinator that just you've seen the explosion out of the offenses that they've coached, is just the ability to utilize the skill position. I mean, this year there was just so there were so many guys that I just wanted to see so much more from, um, not just late in the year, but really all season long. Um, you look at the statistics. I mean, none of those guys really had a huge year, a breakout year. Um, you know, at the receiver and tight end positions. I mean, Travis Dye did what he did, and you started to see it from Cardwell. But at the tail end of the year just wasn't getting the ball as much. So I think you're going to see, um, you know, I, I feel like Dan Lanning should go after a guy who will will get what these guys came to do at Oregon, what they were recruited to do, and that's put up points and get in the end zone and, you know, tear up the field. I, I want to see guys flying down the field like the Chip Kelly, Mark Helfrich, you know, that era. I want I want to see those teams that can put up 50 points on everybody's head. Um, and then you have a defensive coordinator, defensive-minded coach that, it's going to lock it down on the other end. So, yeah, I want to see somebody that will bring this Oregon offense back to life, bring it to, you know, the teams that, you know, people on the East Coast will stay up to watch at 1030 to to see him put up 50, 60 points. Because um, I, I think that's definitely one thing that's been lacking. This Oregon offense hasn't been bad in the last couple of years. I just think there's so much more to be desired and so much you know, potential for this offense to be so much more. Yeah, so much just left on the table you know, these these elite wideouts that they brought in, uh, even though they're freshmen, but Thornton and, and Franklin saw a lot of playing time and they were just getting short passes, intermediate passes, and you need to you need to be able to stretch the field, um, like we've obviously uh, said before. And then just to, uh, another note on Dan Mullen, uh, he's from Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania, originally. So um, I know someone asked about Lanning's East Coast ties, but if you bring in a guy like Mullen, for example, maybe that helps you. But I think that he also has some good ties in the Southeast as far as, you know, uh, being at Florida for multiple stints and then at Mississippi State for a long time. Wasn't the best recruiter, obviously, at Florida. Um, but I think that that could be that could be a, a way that you kind of bolster this staff and, and help get that presence back in the uh, in the Southeast. Uh, a couple more and then we'll uh, wind down here, guys. I know Dylan, we've been going for a while here. Uh, quite a comment from Luke Cyrus Moss. I hope this hire excites him. Really need him with KT gone. Couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, for those of you guys that, uh, you know, maybe don't follow recruiting super closely, Cyrus Moss is on his official visit to USC right now in Los Angeles. Uh, they went in home, Lincoln Riley, and uh, I believe Alex Grinch did as well. They went in home uh, with Cyrus Moss out of Bishop Gorman in Las Vegas. So they went in home, and then Mario Cristobal went in home with uh, Joe Salavea. And I want to say Ken Wilson too, but I'm not 100% sure. But Oregon went in home. I know at least Mario uh, was there after the Pac-12 championship game. Um, and then what's crazy is with Moss, he said it on Twitter. He's in Los Angeles for the official visit to, to uh, USC this weekend, you know, Friday, Saturday. But then he's going across the country to Miami on Sunday. So Mario is going to get one last shot at him. And he's planning on, uh, you know, making his commitment during the early signing period and then announcing – uh, in January at the Adidas All American Bowl, where he's actually going to end up going. So, hopefully, this is a, a hire that can uh, excite him. Obviously, is is what uh, you know the Oregon angle is here. Um, I feel like, man, I I kind of felt like he was USC's to lose when um, you know obviously when Mario uh, left and uh, USC kind of got in the picture right at, the, at just the right time because he was telling me that you know the the culture that that Lincoln Riley is kind of pitching to him is going to be really really big. Um, 
uh, yeah, uh, Lewis, they're talking about, we're talking about uh, Cyrus Moss, um, 2022 elite defensive end linebacker recruit. Um, I think that the, so he was saying that the culture that they kind of had in place was the, the biggest thing for him that didn't really line up with USC, but now that Riley's in, um, it looks like that'll be a, a better situation for him. But yeah, Cyrus Moss has to be one of the, the top priority guys, I would say right now. But man, it feels like the Ducks are kind of uh, out on the outside looking in when they really were in the driver's seat, in my opinion. I talked to Cyrus a bunch of times throughout his process. They were in the driver's seat, I think, to, to get him, even with uh, you know Alabama still pursuing him. But um, man, it's he's his recruitment is definitely one of the more wild ones uh, to track here as he nears the decision. I think Dan Lanning is a perfect hire for someone like Cyrus Moss because Dan Lanning has been a linebackers coach. I mean, he's he's still listed as the defensive coordinator and outside linebackers coach. Um, you know, he's recruited a lot of guys that have come to Georgia that are similar to Cyrus Moss. I think Nolan Smith is kind of one of those, um, you know, a former number one recruit, kind of that defensive and outside linebacker um, hybrid. I think that would be you know, and that's a huge, huge get for Oregon to try to get a guy like Cyrus Moss. Um, and yeah, like Lou said, with with Kayvon Thibodeau being gone, that's um, that's a huge area of need is that edge rusher to really dominate. You're not going to get another Kayvon Thibodeau, but you really need a guy who's going to step in there and, and continue to produce um, at a high level. And I think Cyrus Moss can definitely be that guy. Um, and Dan Lanning is a, is a huge hire. I, I think, you know, his experience that he was an inside linebackers coach. I think he's been an outside linebackers coach, defensive coordinator, recruited um, all positions on defense. He, I think he used to play linebacker in college, too, if I'm not mistaken. So um, I think this just screams, hey, we need to get Cyrus Moss to, to Eugene. Um, I think he's going to be priority number one going forward. Winding down the, the episode of the podcast with some uh, recruiting questions and comments. Um, this one from Andrew saying T-Mac hasn't said anything, but I have to imagine he's USC bound. I wouldn't be so quick to think that, um, you know, a lot of people have commented on this stream that, that, uh, McClendon is, is going to Miami. I haven't heard that, uh, officially. Um, so I feel like as far as T-Mac goes, uh, I think we're going to have to see what happens with McClendon. Uh, if he's retained by this staff, that's obviously going to be a huge piece for, for Oregon to hold on to, um, and you're looking at their wide receivers that they have in the fold right now, T-Mac and is uh, committed. And then you also have wide receiver Stephon Johnson out of uh, Dallas, Texas, uh, also in the fold right now. So that's going to be, I feel like, the the biggest – I think he's the main priority I kind of hit on here for to retain on this uh, current staff that the Ducks have. But uh, we've been going for quite a while here, almost an hour and a half, Dylan. Uh, any final thoughts on landing? I'm sure we'll be back with more – uh, you know, live streams and spaces, but just while we wrap up here. Yeah, I'm just really excited for the future. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote an article this week about um, how Oregon has to absolutely nail this hire or else it just loses all that momentum that's been building. And um, or obviously Oregon needs an, a national championship. They need to get back to the college football playoff. Um, they've come up short so many times and it feels like they just need that coach to get them over the edge. And I felt like this was the most important coaching search in the program's history, given where they're at right now, the level of talent and what we've been able to see in the recruiting trail, the fact that you can bring, you know, talent from all over the country to Oregon. And I think Dan Lenning is a guy who can keep that going. I think he's a guy who can keep the on-field production going, get guys to the NFL. And I think he's really everything you want in, in a hire right now. So um, I'm, I'm very happy. Obviously I think my number one option was Lane Kiffin. Um, but this is, this is easy, uh, easily as good as you can get. So, um, I'm very excited to see what he does on the recruiting trail. Um, I'm excited to watch Georgia play in the college football playoff just to kind of scout, you know, what, what does this defenses look like in those, uh, in those huge stages. Um, but the, the future is really bright, but, um, he's got a lot of work to do and he's never been a head coach before has, you know, recruiting momentum to, to keep going. Um, he's got to build a coaching staff and it's going to be all new. <clears throat> so um i'm excited i'm very very excited um yeah that's pretty much it all right yeah no um just kind of give my final thoughts here uh i think it's a solid hire for sure um he was the the guy that i kind of wanted the ducks to go with once his name kind of entered the into the picture um more so on a friday from kind of what i was hearing with my sources um as far as the timeline goes because obviously the recruiting upside is huge the the defensive mind is huge you got to uh, you want to, you 
you get when you have him, you have someone that can hopefully contend with uh, you know Lincoln Riley's offense if, if it's looking like they're going to be you know the two top teams in the Pac-12 potentially, depending on what happens with Utah. Um, but I think that overall, I, I like the hire a lot. The recruiting upside is there. I'm happy that Oregon took a gamble. I think just with with how crazy the college football landscape's been, with all the other hires and departures that we've seen um, this uh, not even off season because it's I feels like we're we're just kind of getting there. But that was what was so crazy about the carousel is that it happened so early. So I think that it was uh, it was big for them to to try to go. Um, I don't know if I call it the splash hire necessarily, you know, remains to be seen. I think that's the biggest thing I kind of just want to say, take it with a grain of salt. We'll uh, have to see. There's so much more that has to kind of unfold here, what the rest of his staff looks like, especially the offensive coordinator, uh, how he's going to be able to hopefully sal- salvage during this 2022 recruiting class. Um, and, uh, you know, giving him his first shot as a uh, head coach is, is pretty huge, but he has a track record of success and he's been around a lot of, uh, a lot of winners and he knows how to win at a high level. So those are kind of my final thoughts on it. Uh, everybody watching in the live stream, if you guys could do me a huge favor and go ahead and subscribe to the channel, please. And go ahead and hit that uh, notification bell so that you don't miss our future live shows, our future live streams. Um, huge, huge day for Oregon. And we're going to have a bunch of content coming out on ducksdigest.com, si.com slash college slash Oregon. Go ahead and make sure you're locked into the social platforms with both Dylan and myself. You can follow me at the name on your screen there at mtorus sports follow dylan at drk sports news and then you can find ducks digest on the rest of our uh, social media platforms at ducks digest whether it be facebook twitter or instagram uh, and then you can find me always on uh, my youtube channel at oregon football max taurus that's all we have for this one guys thank you so much for listening to another episode of the ducks dish podcast we got plenty more coming with uh, oregon hiring announcing the hire of Dan Lanning as the next head coach of the Ducks. Take care.